Excellent singing, church. Uh, as you heard Matt mention, as well as Smedley, um, our time here in Arizona is coming to an end. Um, so we've got seven Sundays uh, remaining, and we'll be in the book of Haggai for five of those. Uh, I'll preach one more sermon, and then we'll have our, our farewell Sunday. Um, Thank you for, for all of your prayers. I know many people have been praying for us, and I'm getting texts and calls and emails all the time about how people are specifically praying and asking me how they can be praying. And so thank you so much for your love for me and for my family and the core team. Uh, so much is happening in just a little bit of time. Uh, it's taken 15 years, over 15 years to get here, and now things are just happening almost faster than, than I can keep up from finding a, a place to meet and selling our home here. Uh, we've purchased a home in New Orleans. The Robinsons have purchased a home in New Orleans. We actually close, both of us, next week um, or this coming week in, a, in, in just a few days. Uh, Nick Dudley finally got approved by the state to practice real estate in Louisiana and, and just plenty more things that uh, you would be so encouraged to, to hear more about if we had the time. But nevertheless, we, we are uh, in the home stretch now and um, I'll be in the pulpit for uh, the next several weeks, which I'm just thrilled uh, to do. Martin Lloyd-Jones said about preaching that preaching is the most amazing and most thrilling activity that one can ever be engaged in because of all that it holds out for all of us in the present and because of the glorious endless possibilities in an eternal future. It's an excellent way to think about preaching. Um, I can't think of anything else that I could do for this church to contribute to your own uh, progress in godliness, uh, for your own joy in our Savior, and help as you walk this, this Christian life. And so I am just so excited to be opening up God's Word with you. I'm going to pray, and then we'll, we'll talk about Haggai. God, thank you so much for your Word. It is just good to remember that it is a privilege, we're even a privileged people to have your word in our language and in such abundance. Uh, we can hardly go anywhere in our lives where a Bible is not accessible in the English language. This hasn't always been the case. Uh, many people shed their blood <laughs> so that we might be able to access your thoughts, to know what is true so that we would be able to discern uh, the way that we should go, how we should think, what we should believe, what we should do, and how to live. And so this morning, God, let us not take that tremendous privilege for granted. Even as we look to a somewhat unstudied, obscure book like Haggai, I do pray that you would help me to be clear and God, penetrate uh, the hearts of, of all those who hear that we might be more confident of your promises, of your character, your trustworthiness, and that much more eager as we grow in knowledge to draw near to you in faith so that you might receive all the glory from us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. The Gospel writer Luke in the New Testament records an instance when Jesus was teaching a crowd of people. And apparently, at some point in this teaching, when Jesus paused to take a breath, one man thought that it would be a good idea to interrupt Jesus and shout out of the midst of the crowd and ask Jesus to settle a family dispute. The man claimed that he was owed a portion of his father's inheritance and that his brother wouldn't give him what he was owed. Instead of settling the dispute, though, 
and arbitrating between these men, Jesus took this occasion and this interruption to teach the entire crowd, this man included, about human greed. Just imagine the scene. You have a crowd gathered so large, Luke says in chapter 12, verse 1, that there were so many thousands of people who had gathered on this particular occasion following Jesus to hear what he had to say, that people were actually trampling one another. And from the midst of this crowd of many thousands of people becoming dangerous by the moment, more and more dangerous, this man of all the things he could request in that moment of Christ says, Tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Here is this foolish man hazarding his life and the lives of others in this immense crowd. And as he sees an opening, gets close enough to be heard by Jesus, what does he request? His portion in an earthly family inheritance. And it's no wonder, considering these things, that Jesus took the opportunity to teach and talk about human greed. The story proves, if nothing else, the allurement of earthly comfort. It's intoxicating. We desire it. It's alluring. It's encouraged by the culture around us. Pursue comfort. Get comfort at all costs. This is what this man is doing. To him, earthly comfort, wealth in this case, was worth risking his life as well as the lives of others. Nothing would have been more satisfying to this man in that moment than having his desire for earthly comfort met. And he believed that wealth was his solution in life and that if the Son of God would only give it to him, then his soul would be satisfied. And this is why Jesus goes on to warn everybody in earshot, one, that life does not consist in the abundance of things, and therefore that it's foolish to store up earthly treasure without being rich toward God. In other words, it's foolhardy to cause or choose wealth or some other earthly comfort over what God values. We all set priorities. We don't all do it intentionally, but everybody's got priorities. And the culture around us, our own sinful hearts, are constantly encouraging us to wrongly value what God has given. Instead, we should place value on what God values. Israel needed to learn that lesson in Haggai's day. Prioritize what God prioritizes, value what God values. And not only did Israel need to learn that lesson in Haggai's day, but we too need to learn that lesson as well. To value what God values, to prioritize what God says we must. And so I want you to open up to the book of Haggai, because Haggai is going to help us do that very thing. Three books from your New Testament. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, then Matthew begins the New Testament. And since this is the second shortest Old Testament book, we're just going to read through the whole thing this morning. So just follow along as I read. In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of Yahweh came by the hand of Haggai the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, This people says, The time has not come, even the time for the house of Yahweh to be rebuilt. Then the word of Yahweh came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies waste? 
So now, thus says Yahweh of hosts, set your heart to consider your ways. You have sown much, but bring in little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, set your heart to consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and rebuild the house of God, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says Yahweh. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little, and you bring it home, and I blow it away. Why? declares Yahweh of hosts. Because of my house, which lies waste, while each of you runs to his own house. Therefore, because of you, the sky is restrained, has restrained its dew, and the earth has restrained its produce. And I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the wine, on the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on men, on cattle, and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, listened to the voice of Yahweh their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as Yahweh their God had sent him. And the people feared Yahweh. Then Haggai, the messenger of Yahweh, spoke by the commissioned message of Yahweh to the people, saying, I am with you, declares Yahweh. So Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did the work, did work on the house of Yahweh of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius. On the 21st of the seventh month, the word of Yahweh came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who among you remains who saw this house in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem like nothing in your eyes? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares Yahweh. Be strong also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all you people of the land. Be strong, declares Yahweh, and work, for I am with you, declares Yahweh of hosts. As for the promise which I cut with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is standing in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, Once more, in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. And I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the desirable things of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says Yahweh of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares Yahweh of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says Yahweh of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares Yahweh of hosts. On the 24th of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of Yahweh came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Ask now the priests about the law. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread and with, his, with this fold or cooked food, wine, oil, or any other food, will it become holy? And the priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, it will become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is this people. And so is this nation before me, declares Yahweh. And so is every work of their hands. And what they bring near to me there is unclean. But now, O set your heart to consider from this day onward, from before one stone 
was set on another in the temple of Yahweh from when it was that one came to a grain heap of 20 measures, then there would only be 10. And from when one came to the wine vat to draw 50 troughs full, then there would be only 20. I struck you and every work of your hands with scorching wind, mildew, and hail. Yet you did not come back to me, declares Yahweh. O oh, set your heart to consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of Yahweh was founded, set your heart to consider, is the seed still in the barn? Even including the vine, the fig, the pomegranate, and the olive tree, it has not borne fruit. Yet from this day on, I will bless you. And finally, then the word of Yahweh came a second time to Haggai on that same day, the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders and, their, and the horses and their riders will go down, everyone by the sword of another. On that day, declares Yahweh of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares Yahweh, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares Yahweh of hosts. The prophet Haggai, whose name simply means festival, is fixated on one issue. You can hear it over and over and over as we read that. He has one particular matter about which he concerns himself, and that is the rebuilding of the temple. The rebuilding of the temple is his fixation. And this book is so singularly focused on the rebuilding of the temple that one commentator accuses him, as well as Zechariah, of reducing the prophetic word to a mere political program and leading the prophetic office down a shameful path what one man thinks. And it's for the same reason, his singular focus on rebuilding the temple, that another pair of commentators even says that Haggai can have no place among the prophets in the real sense of the word. Well, that's a, a statement, a bold statement made by a fool. But although these accusations are foolish and unfair to Haggai, what this kind of criticism actually gets right is that he is fixated on the rebuilding of the temple. And he hardly moves on from that issue. But to somehow make that a flaw in his prophetic ministry completely misses the purpose of the prophecy. God nor Haggai was ultimately concerned with getting a religious building erected. In fact, the only sermon that I've can ever remember hearing about Haggai, the preacher who preached it had that on his mind. He was trying to get his congregation to, to decorate the church, deck out the church, you know, successfully complete a building campaign. Um, you should just know right now this series will not culminate in a building campaign. <laughs> it's not what it's about. Amen. <laughs> So what is the purpose of Haggai's prophecy if it's not about that? Here's the purpose. Haggai called Israel to prioritize God's gracious presence and enduring promises over earthly comfort by rebuilding the temple. That's the point. The prophet Haggai is calling Israel to prioritize God's gracious presence as well as God's enduring promises over earthly comfort via rebuilding the temple. And I'll explain why I believe this is a, a good way to capture the purpose of this prophecy uh, before we finish today. But that's the purpose. That's what God is wanting to accomplish through Haggai, his prophet. Israel was enjoying, as you heard, temporary earthly comforts, all the while neglecting to do the difficult work of rebuilding the temple. 
They weren't interested in this. But bound up with that building, that all-important building, the temple, was the very presence of God among Israel, as well as the hope of God's future promises. God's presence, his abiding presence, and future promises were actually all attached to a temple. And so Israel, what they needed to do was cast off their lethargy and laziness, their apathy, and do the hard work of rebuilding the temple precisely because of what that temple meant in God's program. We'll see this theme over and over in the coming weeks. And this will be instructive even for us to do something similar, forsake worldly comfort, comforts for what God says we should value. This morning, as we prepare to study this book, just uh, by way of introduction to the book of Haggai, I want to give us three considerations to help us comprehend this book. Three considerations to help us comprehend the book of Haggai. And I'll give them to you all up front. These three considerations are, first, the history of the remnant. The history of the remnant. Second, the terms of the covenant. And third, the significance of the temple. The history of the remnant, the terms of the covenant, and the significance of the temple are three key elements if you're going to understand this book. Now with that, we're going to do some flipping this morning, and we're going to look at what Scripture says in Haggai as well as outside of it about these three things. And first up, we need to look at the history of the remnant. How in the world did Israel end up with barely 50,000 people in the promised land and then on top of that with no place to worship? What in the world happened? Now Haggai is prophesying at this time about 520 B.C., so 520 years before Christ's birth. They show up back in the land, him with about 50,000 other souls, And at this point, by the time Haggai does write down this prophecy, all they've got is a foundation that's been recently relayed for constructing the temple, but still there's no temple standing. Now, the beautiful temple that Solomon had built some 460 years prior is no longer standing. And so we need to look at what happened. If you just flip back in your Bible to 2 Chronicles, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, 2 Chronicles chapter 36 is going to tell us how in the world Israel got here. 2 Chronicles chapter 36 If you hit Psalms, keep going backwards. And we'll start at verse 15. And I'll try and move through these first two points rather quickly because the third is really where we, what we need to understand. In, in verse 15 of 2 Chronicles 36, the writer records, And Yahweh, the God of their fathers, this is the Lord, personal, covenant-keeping name of God, Lord in all caps, that God of their fathers sent word to them again and again by the hand of his messengers, because he had compassion on his people and on his habitation. To hear from God is an act of mercy on God's part. God compassionately sent his messengers to his people. But, verse 16, they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of Yahweh arose against his people until there, until there was no remedy. Therefore he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their choice men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on choice man or virgin, old man or infirm. He gave them all into his hand. And all the articles of the house of God, that was then standing, great and small, and the treasures of the house of Yahweh, and the treasures of the king and his officials, he brought them all to Babylon. Then 
they burned the house of God and tore down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its valuable articles. And those who had escaped from the sword, he took away into exile to Babylon, and they were slaves to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had made up for its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation, it kept Sabbath rest until 70 years were fulfilled. So God has graciously, mercifully sent his messengers. They have been time and time again rejected by Israel until God calls it quits with his people and finally sends them into exile the city and the temple with it are destroyed. This is how you get to Haggai with no temple and only a remnant, what's left of the people, a small segment returning to the land. After Jerusalem was destroyed, just keep reading, verse 22 Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, no longer are the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, in power. The kingdom has changed hands. Now the Persians are in control. And this writer says, in order to complete the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah, Yahweh did something. He stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he had a proclamation passed through his kingdom and also put it in writing saying this, verse 23, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you, you of all his people, may Yahweh his God be with him and let him go up. He makes this decree, sends the remnant back into the land to build a house. This is a pagan king. God predicted that this would happen, and to fulfill his own word, he moves sovereignly on the spirit of a pagan king to go build him a house and send people with him. So the destruction of Jerusalem is followed by the decree of Cyrus, And then if you just turn a few pages to the right, Ezra, you can see they go back. He's a part of the remnant that goes back into Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. But they quickly encounter some opposition. Just notice in verse 10 of Ezra chapter 3. The builders laid the foundation of the temple of Yahweh. Then the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise Yahweh according to the direction of King David of Israel. So it records how they sing. <laughs> There's singing mingled with weeping. So happy are they on this occasion, some of them, that they can't tell the difference between the weeping and the gladness that's going on. After after the foundation is laid, chapter 4, verse 1 begins noting the opposition that they encountered soon after. Then the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to Yahweh, the God of Israel. Verse 2 says they try and get in on the, the building so that they can thwart it. They're rejected in verse 3, but verse 4, so the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and dismayed them from building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So the building of the temple never really gets off the ground, literally doesn't go beyond the foundation And it's thwarted, it's stopped. You have this destruction of Jerusalem, a decree of Cyrus, delayed construction, even to the point where a king commands that they be disallowed from continuing to build. King 
Ahasuerus stops the work later in chapter 4. But then you get this further in chapter 4. Look at verse 24. The building continues. Then as soon as the copy of King Artaxerxes' document was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe, and their colleagues, they went in haste to Jerusalem to the Jews and stopped them by force and military. Then the work on the house of God in Jerusalem stopped, and it was stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And that brings us right back up to speed where we began in Haggai. It is in that second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia, when God comes to Haggai, causes him to prophesy, and causes his people to begin the work again. Just notice in chapter 5, verse 1, Ezra writes about Haggai and Zechariah's participation in the building, uh, in, in supporting this work. The prophets Haggai, verse 1, and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, same Joshua, son of Jehozadak we read about in Haggai, arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. This is the historical context in which we find ourselves in Haggai. This is how the events unfolded from the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem to then, 70 years later, having a, a king of Persia, Darius, decree that the, the building of this temple continue in, his, in the second year of his reign. And so that brings us up to speed to where we are and just gives us the history of the remnant. This is how the people ended up here with these prophets. Second, the terms of the covenant are crucial to understanding the book of Haggai, the terms of the covenant, number two. When God made a covenant with Israel in the wilderness after they came out of Egypt, this is before they entered Canaan, that covenant came with terms that would bring either God's blessing or God's curse. And the terms were clearly laid out for Israel. Flip back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. We can see these terms in short order. You probably have some kind of heading in your Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Blessings of obedience or curses for disobedience. Just notice, if you just take a step back and look at your Bible for a second, in Deuteronomy 28, the blessings of obedience section is rather short. And how long is the curses for disobedience? That's right, some of you are still turning pages. It's long. <laughs> this is because the people are not going to obey God. And the blessings are so simple and clear. Look at verse 1. If you diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I am commanding you today, Yahweh your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. They'll be made prominent. And it just gives us a brief list. All the blessings will come upon you and overtake you. If, here's the conditions, the terms, you listen or obey the voice of Yahweh your God, you'll be blessed, verse 3, blessed, verse 4, blessed, verse 5, blessed, verse 6. All they have to do is obey. All they have to do is the impossible task of obeying Yahweh as he's commanded. Look at the blessings for, dis or excuse me, the curses for disobedience. Look at verse 15. But it will be if you do not listen to the voice of Yahweh your God to keep and to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. 
Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field, instead of blessed. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground and the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. Yahweh will send upon you the curse, confusion, and rebuke in all that you send forth your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly on account of the evil deeds because you have forsaken me. Yahweh will make the pestilence cling to you until he has consumed you from the land where you are entering to possess it. Yahweh will strike you with consumption and with fever and with inflammation and with fiery heat and with the sword and with scorching wind and with mildew, and they will pursue you until you perish. And the heaven which is over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you iron. Yahweh will make the rain of your land powder and dust. From heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. So just notice how creation is not going to cooperate with Israel if they get into the land and disobey. And this is the same land that was spoken about going into the promised land. Do you remember how it was described? A land flowing with what? Milk and honey. What do you have to have to get milk? You have to have livestock, cattle. And if it's flowing with milk, you've got plenty of that. And honey, your crops, the vegetation is going to be plenteous. And so God was causing that land, even before Israel got there, to flourish. It was uh, in some places in Scripture called like the garden of God. You know, this is as close to Eden as you can find on planet Earth at this time. But all of this would be reversed and undone if Israel disobeyed the Lord when they got into the land. Even notice in verse 38... And then after this, we'll, jump, we'll, we'll fast forward back to, to Haggai. You shall bring out much seed in the, to the field, but you will gather in little, for the locusts will consume it. You shall plant and cultivate vineyards, but you will neither drink of the wine nor gr gather the grapes, for the worm will devour them. You shall have olive trees throughout your territory, but you will not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olives will drop off. I mean, you can't even get there fast enough to collect it before God's causing some bug to come consume it or it to go bad. You're supposed to have much. You've planted much. You've planned for much. And you get little. Go back to Haggai because this is the very thing happening in Haggai. He mentions this a number of times. Look at Haggai chapter 1, verse 6. Here he just says it. You have sown much, but bring in little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. So you put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. You just can't even keep what's profitable. Just notice, these are, this is a, a similar description, similar language, similar things happening is what we just read. What's going on in Haggai's day? God is cursing the people. The curse remains. God is faithful to his word to curse, just as he has been and always will be faithful to his word to bless. He is also faithful, true to his own character, true to his own word to curse. And this comes up a number of times in the letter, in the, in the prophecy. And so these things are happening because the covenant still stands. The covenant that he enacted under Moses still stands. And so this remnant comes back to Jerusalem, to the land. And because of their continued disobedience, they experience the curses of God. It's good to not forget in chapter 2, verse 19, that does turn. God doesn't maintain the curses on his people. 
but he even says that a day has come when at the end of verse 19, yet from this day on, I will bless you. And so the blessings also, even in the same book, quickly come into view. And so those two things are going to be good for us to keep in mind, the his- history of the remnant as well as the terms of the covenant. And finally here, the significance of the temple. The significance of the temple. The significance of the temple can be summarized in this way. God's gracious presence and God's enduring promises. God's gracious presence and God's enduring promises. These things are inextricably connected to that building. (laughs) There's one building on planet earth that God has attached his name to in an enduring way and established it, had it built for his glory to be made known everywhere by every nation on planet earth. And that's the temple in Jerusalem. Solomon built it first. And this became the embodiment of of these two ideas, really. The gracious presence of God and the enduring promises of God. And again, we're going to turn to see this. You notice, just don't forget, Haggai is fixated on rebuilding the temple. If it was just a building, it wouldn't matter that much. It's not just a building is the point. God is attached by his own design, his gracious presence to this building, this temple, as well as his enduring promises. To see that, we need to go all the way back to Exodus because as we've been saying, if you've been uh, at evening services, no matter where you are in your Bible, all roads lead back where? To Torah. That's right. All All roads in the Bible lead back ultimately to the Torah, the first five books written by Moses. And Haggai is no exception. In Exodus chapter 25, Looking at verse 8, before there was a temple or even a thought of a temple, God determined to dwell amongst his people. And so, to do that, he told Moses not to build a temple. That would have been pretty impossible to move around the wilderness. But instead, to build a tent. Look at verse 8. And let them make a sanctuary for me, God says that I may dwell among them, Exodus 25, 8. A sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That's the purpose statement. Why do you want to tent God? Because I am eager to dwell among my people. And that became the center of everything Israel did in the wilderness. You had 12 tribes, Four to the north, four to the east, four to the south, four to the west. That needs to be command central, the temple, the place of worship. Where God is, we're going to be around him. So literally, he is in the midst, in the middle of his people. Verse 9 says, according to all that I am going to show you. So Moses is given a sight of what he's to make as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture so just so you shall make it so God's going to show him a pattern lay this out for him give him specific instructions and that's when you get about eight chapters that you've probably if, it, if I'm going to guess struggled in your quiet times to make it through because he's just describing the dimensions the materials Every specification is precise. Why? God dwells there. This is important. His presence will be in this place. Just fast forward to Exodus 40. Once this tent is finished being made, verse 34, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Exodus 40, 34. 
and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting. Notice it was called a sanctuary by God, uh, a tent of meeting here. Moses wasn't able to enter it because the cloud had dwelt on it and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. So God validates, affirms his willingness to dwell here. God is a God who longs to, loves to dwell among his people. If you just turn one page to the right, Leviticus, you get Leviticus. And what's happening? God has set his glory on this this tent. And then what do we find? He, look at verse 1. He calls Moses, spoke to him from the tent of meeting, because he's there now. Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when any man from among you brings an offering near to Yahweh, notice the proximity language, near. How is it near? How can you get near to Yahweh? Well, he's in the tent of meeting. Going to the tent of meeting is how you dwell, draw near to Yahweh but not empty-handed. You shall bring your offering of animals from the herd or the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall bring it near. A male without blemish, he shall bring it near to the doorway of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before Yahweh. You can't get close to God without the shedding of blood is what's about to happen. Now he's about to delineate the instructions, lay out for his people how you get close to God without perishing. God's here. He's in the tent of meeting. That's his presence. That's where he's going to dwell. But you better show up with a substitute. There has to be bloodshed. And so this is what makes it not just God's presence, but God's gracious presence. What makes the presence gracious? Just notice who's laying out the way to approach him. God is. God is. He is giving his people a a way to suitably come near to him. He didn't have to do that. And he says in verse 3, at the end of verse 3, that he may be, this is the worshiper, that the worshiper may be what? accepted before Yahweh. Wow. Sinful people can approach God and be acceptable to him? Is that not good news? You want the gospel of Leviticus? There it is. A holy God, unworthy of being approached, allows sinful men and women to draw near to him through his own prescribed offering. (laughs) That's good news. So it's not just his presence. It's gracious of him to dwell among his people and in this way. So the tabernacle, before there was a temple, was about God's gracious presence. And just notice this acceptability that God approves in the worshiper. Verse 4 says, He lays his hand on the head of the burnt offering that it may be accepted for him to do this, make atonement on his behalf, a covering that temporarily forgives the worshiper, temporarily provides a way for that sinner until the next time he sins and has to bring another offering. His sins are covered, atoned for. You just see this repeat itself. Uh, Chapter 4, verse 20, 26, 31, 35. In each of those, the priest makes atonement for them, and they will be forgiven. Thus, the priest will make atonement for him in regard to his sin, and he will be forgiven. Thus, the priest, verse 31, shall make atonement for him, and he will be forgiven. And then chapter 4 ends, Thus the priest shall make atonement for him in regard to his sin, which he has committed, and he will be forgiven. Sinful men can come before a holy God 
if they approach God on God's terms and be forgiven. And that in that way, he will dwell among them. That is good news. You can just write down 1 Kings chapter 8 because that is when the tabernacle, this uh, tent, is replaced by the temple. But one more passage we have to see before we end our time here today is 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And what Second, what happens in 2 Samuel 7 is the Davidic covenant. Just um, you know, tattoo that on your mind. 2 Samuel 7, Davidic covenant. That's what's happening there. That's the significance of this chapter. David looks out his window as king after God has given him victory and settled him comfortably in Jerusalem. He's singularly got the throne now. He looks out of his own house. And goes, what in the world is God doing dwelling in a tent? Really? I'm in a house made of cedar, sturdy, strong, glorious. I mean, the tabernacles got splendor. You read what Moses was to construct. It's, it's glorious, but it's still a tent. And David's got an issue with that. He longs to glorify God. And so he says, we got to do something about this. We need to build God a house. And so this is what he says to the prophet Nathan. And so Nathan encourages him, then do it. 2 Samuel 7 verse 5, or excuse me, verse 3. But before David can even get anywhere further in his thoughts, God comes to Nathan, sends him back to David, and says this in verse 5. Go say to my servant David, thus says Yahweh, are you the one who would build me a house to inhabit? For I have not inhabited a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt even to this day. But I have been going about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone about with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? But he does commend David. He commends David for actually warning to build him a house. Verse 9, I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name like the name of the great men who are on the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in their own place and not be disturbed again. Notice this is while Israel has control of the land. They're the world power, and yet God is promising something more, causing David and everyone else to look further into the future. He says, The unrighteous will not afflict them anymore as formerly, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. Yahweh also declares to you that Yahweh will make a house for you, David. David, I know you want to build me a house. Great idea. But God turns the tables. You're not going to bless me, David. I'm going to bless you. You want to build me a house? I'm going to build you a house, a family. And he goes on to describe this family, this descendant, this seed that will come. We won't read it all, but in this chapter, God promises David a great name. He promises a permanent place for Israel peace for Israel, rest from war for Israel, a seed for David, a kingdom for that seed, an enduring dominion for this coming seed, sonship for this coming seed, steadfast love that will not depart from this coming seed, an enduring house for David, and an enduring or everlasting kingdom. Promises. Not only will God's gracious presence dwell in this building, this temple, but when it is constructed, David, just know that my enduring promises are attached to it. The building of this house, which he details in verse 13, 
as well as an enduring throne are both promised. So the building, the temple where worship would be taking place, people could be accepted before God when they came on God's terms, is also connected to a promise of an enduring kingdom and an everlasting throne, everlasting dominion. One commentator says regarding the people's refusal to build the house in Haggai, he says the refusal to build the house was the rejection of the offer of grace, the divine grace or the grace of divine indwelling. The building of the house is not a cultic or having to do with the temple technique whereby humans pressure or even seek to please God. The building of this house is an act of obedience performed in the faith that God will keep his promise. The Lord's case against Haggai's people was simple. You did not want me. By refusing to build the temple, that's what the people were communicating to God. We don't want you. Your gracious presence, your enduring promise, promises, we're not interested in. Which is why Haggai called Israel to prioritize those very things. Haggai called Israel to prioritize God's gracious presence and enduring promises over earthly comforts. You have your own houses, but there's something greater. Prioritize something else and do that by rebuilding the temple. Because by rebuilding the temple, to do that in faith implies, communicates, that you desire God's gracious presence among you that you look forward and anticipate his enduring promises. For us, what, what does this mean? This means something similar for us. We serve a God who is eager to dwell with his people, even us, sinners. He is eager to dwell with his people. Smith's preaching Revelation, what do we find in the opening of Revelation? Jesus is walking among the lampstands, among the churches. The Spirit speaking to the churches. God is a God who is eager to dwell among his people. And we also serve a God who, as he dwells among us, is eager to forgive sins. He's eager. We just have to come to him on his terms. And that requires an impossible amount of humility that only God can give to forsake self, to cast scorn on our own wisdom, to repudiate our own righteousness and any works that we might bring to be acceptable before God, to say, no, God, those are worthless. I'm helpless and cursed if it is not for your grace. I believe you. I trust you. Will you be merciful to me, a sinner? He is eager to forgive on those terms. And we serve a God who is faithful to keep his promise even unto eternity. And that is exactly where Haggai goes. A day when the heavens and earth, the sea and the dry land will be shaken. Kingdoms will be removed, save one. And a king will one day reign on his throne in the, the temple Glory will come back to that house, the house of God, because King Jesus will be reigning there in all of his splendor with all of the nations, all of his enemies under his feet, finally seated on the throne of David. This is what was predicted. This is what's coming. Do you know that God? Will you see that day? Do you belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken? And over the next few weeks, I hope that with greater confidence, you can say, yes, I belong to that kingdom. I know it's coming, and I cannot wait to see Jesus have his day. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for these marvelous truths that you would communicate truths too great for us to understand, too great for us to comprehend and even believe on our own. 
And because you are a God who is merciful and gracious, who is slow to anger, who abounds in steadfast love and faithfulness toward those who fear him, God, you keep steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Thank you. If there are any here who do not yet believe, who have resisted in trusting their own souls to Christ, God, would you make them cast off all earthly comforts to just have him, the true treasure? And those of us who do know you, make us live more consistently with what we already believe to be true by your grace, that we too would cease to prioritize earthly comforts so that we might have the kingdom that is coming and all the promises coming with it. And we ask all these things in King Jesus' name. Amen.